to the sunset in the evening. I will praise you. I will praise you. A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Dear sisters, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nowadays, when we hear the name of Khadija, what are the characteristics that people usually highlight about her? I just want you to shout out that she was loyal. Highest. In the popular media, for example, when they ever talk about Khadija, what is the main thing they usually talk about? That she was a businesswoman. She was the most beloved person to the Prophet وسلم, the most beloved wife. But yeah, this, this, uh, that she was older than him. But this point about the businesswoman, um, I remember when I, I was invited to talk about Khadija Nadila uh, Anha on a BBC radio show. And uh, the main thing that they wanted to highlight about her in the whole show was that she was this amazing role model. And the reason why she was an amazing role model was because she was wealthy, and she was a businesswoman. And the way they were kind of painting the image of her was that she was a career woman, basically, right? Like a modern career woman. And, and, and the presenter even looked at us and asked her, why is it that Khadija was such a you know, progressive uh, career woman and a businesswoman? And uh, you know, Muslim women nowadays, they're not seen as being like that. And obviously, I could tell from that that there was, they were being very selective about the characteristics of Khadija that they wanted to highlight. Because, alhamdulillah, the last, in the last uh, few years, I had the opportunity to write a book about the life of Khadija, radiallahu anha. And it took me a long time, probably a hundred hours or more, to research the book, to go into the Arabic sources, to read about what the scholars had said about her, what the Prophet ﷺ had said about her, what all sorts of people in the past had said about her, and why she had the status that she had. And I know that although in the West, it sounds like the highlight of her characteristics that she was a businesswoman, to be honest, that was not at all the thing that made her great. That was a good characteristic of hers, you know, that she had business acumen, etc. But that's not what made her have the status of being one of the four greatest women. And as, as Muslim women living in the West, we have to be aware that sometimes certain narratives are pushed to us to give us an image of what Khadija was like or what women, Muslim women of the past were like, that actually, if you were to really investigate, that wasn't the focus of their life at all. That's just what some people want us to adopt from their lives, right? So, what were the characteristics, the key characteristics that in my investigation, in my research for my book that I found were what you could call the, the very big kind of life lessons from Khadija's life? I really thought hard about this after looking at everything and I would say there are five there are five major life lessons that we can learn from the life of Khadija and I'm going to talk to you about them today the first big life lesson that we can learn from Khadija is to live beyond our own lives to live beyond our own lives. Khadija radiallahu anha, you know, subhanAllah, one of the things you realize after all the journey of her life, after all that she went through, and I can give you some examples of that. You know, she was a, a woman of high nobility, and she lost that status when she decided to support the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She spent her wealth in the way of Allah. She literally bankrolled 
the dawah. She bankrolled Islam. We, sitting here in London, a thousand four hundred years later, we are part of Khadija's legacy. Because the message of Islam could not have spread, could not have been nurtured, and could not have been uh, maintained and funded if it wasn't for the wealth of Khadija. She did all of that, and then she was boycotted. Things were thrown at her home. Her husband, obviously, the Prophet وسلم, he was vilified. People laughed at her family when she lost children. Every time a child of hers would pass away, there was like, you know, like the equivalent of the media, the, the tabloid, right? Laughing at her and spreading rumors about her and her family. She went through all of that and then she went through a boycott, right? Where she was literally, had, she literally had to leave her home and live in a tent for a number of years. And after all of that, she passed away. Before the Prophet ﷺ even went to Medina, before he'd even met the Ansar, she passed away. What does that tell us? It tells us that she never got to see the fruits of her efforts in her lifetime, right? She never got to see it, but it was okay because she was living for something beyond her own life. And the reason why we need to know that, sisters, is that we need to understand that we may not see the fruit of our efforts in our lives, but it's okay. We need to build it anyway. We need to do the work anyway. It takes visionary people who are willing to not just have, you know, think about their own self-gratification and the short-term uh, gratification of their own lives and their own little families. It takes people who are willing to look beyond that, beyond their own life, to think long-term to bring about good in this world and to build something that you will be rewarded for in the hereafter. So, what we need to do, sisters, is think long-term. Think beyond our own lives. What are you going to build that's going to last beyond your own life? What, when you, when in our everyday actions with our kids, we need to think long-term. What attitude am I instilling in my kids? When I tell my daughter not to wear her hijab because I'm feeling a bit scared because of what's in the news, or when I tell my son to sort of hide the fact that he's a Muslim, what am I actually storing up for the future Ummah? If my children are afraid, what will their children be like? And what will their children be like? So we need to have that kind of long-term thinking, my sisters. And the reason why we need to do that is because this is exactly what will revive the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is exactly what will continue to benefit us when we are lying in our graves, right? No longer able to benefit ourselves. It's those things we left behind in the world that continue to bring benefit to the world that will continue to benefit us in the grave. So that's the first thing, that Khadija was willing to live beyond her own life. The second big life lesson from the life of Khadija is that we should realize that we should expect to be tested. We should expect to be tested because the greatest people who ever walked on this earth, they were tested. And if they were tested, then we will be tested. She was tested in so many ways. We know that she lost husbands in the past. She was a widow. A huge test with young children. She also lost many children. You know, a number of her children passed away before the Prophet and after she married the Prophet And there was, there was a time when when the Prophet ﷺ had brought his message and the uh, Quraysh were trying to put so much pressure on his family to stop preaching the message that every single day there would be rocks 
and filth hurled into her home. Because one of the things um, I found when I researched was that Khadija Rabbulanha, the way her house was, she had a part of the home that was covered with a roof, but then there was like an inner courtyard that didn't have any roof. And that's somewhere that maybe she used to sit with her children, do different things. But subhanAllah, the Quraysh, they wanted to put so much pressure on them that they would send slaves, they would hire slaves to go and throw rocks and rubbish and garbage basically over her wall into that part of her house. And that became her everyday life, right? So if we think we're facing Islamophobia, they were facing Islamophobia on another scale, on a very, very direct scale. Why do we need to know this? Why do we need to know and learn about the struggles of people like Khadija and the things that they went through? Because then it will help us to realize that this has happened before. You know, we're not some unique generation that is facing a unique dislike or hatred of Islam. No, it's happened throughout Islamic history. And when you know that, and you, can, you learn how those great people of the past stayed patient, they stayed patient. And when we say patience, we mean they continued to obey Allah, regardless of what was happening. And they continued to stay away from sins, regardless of what was happening. When we learn about that, it makes us strong. It strengthens us. It makes us feel like we could do it too. We can do it too. We've got them as our role models. So what do we need to do? We need to be prepared for challenges. We need to be expecting tests. We, and we need to challenge ourselves to respond to those tests as our best selves, as the best version of ourselves, right? If we do this, my sisters, it will help us not to lose our Iman. When we realize that we are gonna face tests, then when those tests come along, you know, we're, we're not shocked. We're, we're expecting them, we're, we're strengthening our character, we're strengthening ourselves for those tests. Unfortunately, sometimes, we as women, we invest so much time and money into our physical selves, right? We'll spend hundreds of pounds at the beautician, to get our hair done, to buy new buyers that we don't even need. Talking about myself as well, right? We'll do that, but are we investing in our character? Are we investing in us? Because believe me, and I've just nearly hit 40, right? Believe me, it's not gonna last forever. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at yourself. That beauty, that youth, over time, it is gonna wane. That's just a fact of life. So what's gonna be left? What's gonna be left of you except your character? And if you haven't built up that character, if you haven't built up that, your knowledge, you, you know, the essence that is you, that is not your body, that's the thing inside your body. If you haven't built that up, then what is your worth really? You've only, invested in yourself superficially. So my sisters, don't neglect that. Don't neglect that. Expect to face tests and prepare your character for those tests. The third big life lesson from the life of Khadija is stand firm upon Islam in difficult, difficult times. Now, there's a scene from, the, from my book, which is from the life of Khadija. I just want to read this out to you because it really illustrates what I mean by standing firm, firm upon Islam even when it's tough. Khadija anha, she was firm upon Islam at a time when it wasn't popular to be a Muslim, right? It wasn't fashionable, it wasn't cool. Like now it's kind of cool to have a beard, right? But the brothers who, had, who, who kept their beards before it was cool to have a beard, inshallah, they, will have, they would have had a greater reward at that time, right? So us living in the West, sometimes we feel 
it's harder for us to be visibly Muslim, but we should realize that it's, because it's hard, it means we're gonna get greater reward as well. It's not the same reward as somebody who's living in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or somewhere where hijab is normal, right? So I'm gonna read this to really drive home to you what it meant when the message came to Khadija. And remember that she was what we would call an upper class woman. She was very sought after. Everyone had proposed for her. Everyone wanted to marry her when her husband passed away. And she didn't need to marry anyone because she had enough wealth and she was happy. She had a lot of family, right? And she was a celebrity. She was really a celebrity, a very noble and dignified celebrity. So in this scene, she brings the Prophet ﷺ to Waraka and he tells Waraka about what has just happened to him on the mountain. And Waraka, it says, then Waraka's gleeful expression turned into a worried frown. How I wish that I were young and could live until the time when your people try to drive you out, he lamented. Will they drive me out, Muhammad? The Prophet of Allah asked solemnly. It was inconceivable to him, the grandson of the great Abdul Muttalib, loved and respected by all in Mecca, that a day might come when his people would actually disown him? Yes, Waraka replied gravely. Never has a man come with anything similar to what you have, but that he was treated with enmity. If I could live to see that day, I would surely support you with all my might. And as the predictions fell from Waraka's lips, the realization dawned upon Prophet Muhammad and Khadija that life would never be the same again. So from that moment onwards, Khadija's life was not the same. When she decided to stand by the Prophet that was it. She was letting go of her status in this life. So she was a Muslim when it was unpopular to be a Muslim. And the reason why we need to know this is that being a believer, when it's not fashionable to be a believer, gives us a greater reward, right? We have to get used to the idea that as the Prophet wasallam said, Islam began as something strange and it will return to being something strange. So give glad tidings to the strangers. We have to embrace being the strangers. It's okay to be the different ones. It's okay to be the strangers. Eventually the world will catch up with us. Eventually they will. <coughs> embrace being a stranger. And the reason why we need to internalize this lesson is that then when we do face that difficulty, when it becomes hard to practice Islam, when it becomes hard to be visibly Muslim, then we won't give up. We won't fall down at the first hurdle. We'll, and we'll realize that we're gonna get more reward. You know, SubhanAllah, sometimes um, when people say, you know, we shouldn't put so much pressure on sisters, we should, when it feels difficult, when there's some attack somewhere, and we feel like Muslims might be in danger, we should just let sisters relax and, you know, maybe stop wearing hijab or something like this. People say that. And I always think of my own mother. And I think, subhanAllah, she used to walk on the streets of, we grew up in Hackney. She used to walk on the streets of Hackney at a time when nobody wore hijab. We didn't know anybody who wore hijab in the 70s, in the late 70s, early 80s. Nobody wore hijab. They were Muslims, but they didn't look visibly Muslim at all. My mom was the only woman who wore hijab. She used to walk on the street. And every time we pass by somebody, a white person, basically, he would say something. Every time. And us kids, we just knew, just like part of life, that we're gonna walk down the street with mom and she's gonna get called names. The good thing was she didn't understand English. So <laughs> I don't think she, she, she really noticed. But us kids, we noticed, right? We noticed. 
And then when we started school, we were the only ones who wore hijab. So are we gonna now, at when we've grown up, and now so many people wear hijab, and it's so normal, are we gonna give up now? No, we've gotta be made of stronger stuff than that. We've got to remember those women before us who wore, who exerted hijab at a time when it was really hard. That was hard. This isn't hard. It's all in our mind. Often, it's in our mind that it's hard, right? So stand firm upon Islam, even when it's tough, and realize that all those things you find harder because you're in a non-Muslim country, it's harder to go to the mosque, it's harder to, you know, force yourself away from certain materialistic things, maybe. It's harder to be visibly Muslim. It's hard to do da'wah, to talk to people about Islam, to clarify things. You're going to get greater reward as well, right? The fourth big lesson from the life of Khadija is that she used every resource that she had for the sake of Allah. She gave up wealth. That's hard enough, right? To give up your wealth for the sake of Allah. But probably the greatest thing she gave up, the greatest two things, were her status, right? It's not easy. I mean, even now, when you think of people who are baronesses and you know politicians and people who've reached certain statuses in society, you kind of expect them to be sellouts, right? A little bit. But you kind of make excuses for them, like, okay, you know, they have to shoes, they have to do the alcohol, they have to do the this and the that, whatever, right? We make excuses for them because we think that with status comes compromise, right? Well, Khadija anha had that status already, and she gave that up when she became a Muslim, when she chose Islam, because she chose the truth above this world, this material world. And because of that, she gained status in the real place where status matters, and that is in the hereafter. She gained the greatest status in Jannah, and that's where it really matters. The reason why we need to know this is we also have to be prepared to give up our resources. So the other um, thing that Khadija gave up for the sake of Allah was peace. Peace. A life that is easy, peaceful, afia, you know? She was living a comfortable life. But she gave up that peace of mind of just living your life, having your nice house, your nice car, your nice little family, just take care of your own little nuclear family. She gave that peace up for the sake of the message of Islam. And that is why the angel came down and gave her glad tidings of a house in Jannah made of pearls and jewels. And he said, where there will be no more noise and no more hardship. Because one of the things that she had to endure a lot was a lack of peace. And because of that, Allah promised her peace in the hereafter. So what do we need to do knowing this? Realize that everything that we have we could use it for the sake of Allah. We can be tools for the sake of Allah. Don't give up your deen. Don't give up your principles for the, for the sake of status. Be willing to do the difficult things. Be willing to have the difficult conversations for the sake of having a higher status in the hereafter. And the fifth lesson, my sisters, from the life of Khadija is to be a source, a, to be a dependable source of comfort for the people in your life. When the Prophet ﷺ was shaken, he wanted Khadija. When he doubted himself, he wanted Khadija. When he came down from the mountain and he, he thought he was going mad, all he wanted was Khadija. And the only one who could give him comfort was Khadija. She was so wise. Even in that difficult moment, she didn't, she didn't give her husband a barrage of questions, a barrage of negative things, right? He'd come home so late on the mountain. 
She was wise. She was patient. And then she even had the wisdom and the foresight to take him to Waraka, her cousin. So you see, and because of that, the Prophet ﷺ never forgot her. He never forgot her. She was an unforgettable woman. Even after, as you know, you know, she, he always remembered her. Even after the Battle of Badr, he saw her necklace in the ransom money that had been sent for his daughter's husband. His daughter was, mar was still married to a non-Muslim, right, Zainab, she was married to uh, a non-Muslim man, and he had been forced to fight in the fa Battle of Badr. And then when he had been caught at the end as a prisoner of war, he was lined up, shackled with the other prisoners, and there was a big pile of wealth that had been sent from the people in Makkah to ransom all the prisoners of war. And his daughter also was in Makkah still. And she had sent her jewelry to ransom her husband. And subhanAllah, when the Prophet went past that pile of ransom money, he noticed a special necklace there. And it was a, a red carnelian necklace made of carnelian stones from Yemen. And he picked it up and he recognized immediately that this was a necklace of Khadija that she had given to her daughter on her wedding. And he began to cry. He was so moved. And the Sahaba saw this and they wondered what, what had happened. And he said, this is from Zainab. And he said, if you don't mind, he said to the Sahaba, if you don't mind, return her prisoner to her, her husband, and this necklace as well. And they said, of course, we don't mind. But he was so moved because it reminded him of Khadija. And then, as we know, Aisha Radilan was so jealous of Khadija because the Prophet ﷺ kept mentioning her. He kept mentioning her to the point that she said, why do you still remember a lady who's long gone? Right? An old lady, she's long gone. And the Prophet ﷺ said to her and rebuked her. And after this, Aisha never said anything about Khadija again because she realized what a high status this woman had. He said, she had faith in me when people rejected me. She believed in me when the people disbelieved me. She supported me when, with her wealth when people prevented wealth from me. And Allah blessed me with children through her and not through any other wife. So my sisters, what can we learn from this? Learn and know your power, my sisters. The power of femininity. The power of femininity. You never hear the words power and femininity together, right? But our femininity has a, a unique and special power. And that's what Khadija had. She was irresistible. She was a comfort. She was wise. And she was very feminine. She didn't need to be like a man in order to have her status. Our femininity means that we can use our qualities as women to influence the people in our lives and to be a source of comfort and to not be ashamed of that. You know, the great women of the past, they were not ashamed to be the supporters of men, of great men. Bukhari's mother, Imam Bukhari's mother, she was not Bukhari, right? She didn't become famous as Bukhari, the author of this book, etc., etc. But that doesn't diminish her status. In fact, she gets reward for, for bringing about Bukhari and all the work that Bukhari brought about. She might not be more famous than him, but she has a status with Allah, right? And she has, in fact, a greater role because in a, in a way she's the architect. She's the one who, who was the visionary who built Bukhari into being who he was. Without her, he wouldn't have. He was a little blind boy. What would he have done if his mother didn't believe in him and work hard for him? So my sisters, we need to not be ashamed. In fact, we need to be proud to support the men in our lives and our families. 
We need to be a source of comfort for them. Believe me, we have the power to change the culture of our households in a way that nobody else does. And it is hard, I know it's hard. There are times when the culture in your household has gone really, gotten really bad. But as a woman, you have the power to change that, if you believe it. So support the people in our lives. Let's be sources of comfort and wisdom. Let's strengthen ourselves to the point that we, we know, or our families know, that anything difficult that happens, we're not the first person who's going to fall down. We're going to be the strong one. We're going to be the unshakable. Just like Khadija anha was. Modern living is tearing families apart, my sisters, because we have this man versus woman attitude, right? Women and men are competing against each other, husbands and wives, comparing each other's roles, comparing who gets more time to do what they want to do. But we are here to complement one another, just as Khadija complimented the Prophet and we should be proud of that. Khadija was not ashamed of that at all, and it didn't diminish her status at all. She was, as we know, one of the four greatest women who ever lived. So my sisters, I'm gonna recap those five qualities. Live beyond your own life. Number two, expect to be tested. Number three, stand firm upon Islam, even when it gets tough. Number four, use every resource you have for the sake of Allah. And number five, be a wise, dependable source of comfort for your family and the people in your life. Inshallah, with that I will leave you. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdi. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Stuff, you know, I was born to praise you.